looks like we are up and running. Let me just go close the door real quick. Then we'll do a couple minutes, we'll get started. presentation pulled up. Today, everybody, we will be doing intermediate cameras. Um, so the main point of today's class is really focusing in on those uh, more advanced settings on our camera. Instead of allowing the camera to be automatic, we're really going to take ownership today and learn things like the um, f-stop, shutter, and ISO, how they all work separately and then how they all come together. We'll look at some photo examples of all that too, so we make sure we understand that. Uh, and then from there, we'll really get into lenses and talk about what lenses really do for you, how to understand focal length and zoom, and then what lenses you quote unquote need. And the reason I say quote unquote is because you don't really necessarily need any set of lenses. Um, there's, there's really no like written out exactly what you need and don't need. Um, but there are good examples or ways to make sure you don't buy products that you don't necessarily need. So. Without further ado, let's get jumped right into it. Get jumped into it, right into it. Uh, intermediate cameras. So, let's start with why do we go advanced point and shoot, DSLR, or mirrorless? Um, really, the idea behind going more advanced is because we want better pictures, or maybe we want more control over our pictures. Um, a lot of the times I have people, they get a camera, they love it, it's their first camera, but they're limited in the facts of what they can do and can't do. And so they're looking for something that gives them more of an oomph, if you will. Um, and that's where breaking away from your phone, getting into a mirrorless or DSLR or point and shoot is great, but then getting advanced within those are even better because you're truly using all the features that were made for your camera. Now, there's all sorts of settings and controls and manipulations and, and auto white balance and light metering and there's a lot of different stuff that you can do including creative filters too as far as the color is concerned. But the main thing we're trying to learn is the basic or let's say more advanced controls of a camera. Rather than let it shoot in auto, how do we make that camera work? And that's what we're learning now. So I like to use these pictures as my beginning example. So, why would we rather go more advanced? And I think a good way to start is by talking about a snapshot versus a photograph. Now, in my opinion, a snapshot is a quick picture. It's not meant to be something thought out or planned or manipulated. You know, if you're with your friends and they're asking, hey, where are you right now? You might, if you don't know exactly, take a picture of where you're at and text it to them or send it to them and say, hey, I'm, I'm at the escalator right here at Act. Um, but if you're trying to take an actual photograph, something more thought out, more methodical, you're going to get something probably closer to like this, where you're checking all of your settings on your camera. You're making sure that your frame is balanced. You're making sure that your ISO is turned at an appropriate level. You're making sure your f-stop, your background to foreground separation is in an appropriate spot. And shutter speed, at least in this case for a non-moving object, probably doesn't matter too much. But it's those extra thoughts or details that we're looking at that change something as so easy as a snapshot of something very quick, you do it with your phone, you do it with your camera on an automatic setting, to something more methodical and plotted out, more like this image that you see here. So the difference between a snapshot photograph, a snapshot is a quick image. It's not meant to take a lot of time, a lot of thought or energy. It's meant to be a quick pop off of the camera. As a photograph, really has some intention behind it. Every time you're holding that camera and you take a picture, you're not just taking a picture to take a picture, you're, you're planning something, whether that's looking at the composition or the color or any, whatever have you, you're planning something with a photograph. Step one, and I talked about this last week, is to learn your camera. I, I like this slide a lot because I think it illustrates exactly the, uh, how many cameras there are. Um, this doesn't even include brands like Fuji, Olympus, Hasselblad, um, uh, Leica. This really just includes the big three, so Nikon, Sony, Canon. 
And at the current moment, there's even more models out there. Sony released three new models since this last one's been out. Nikon's released at least four or five new models since this came out. And Canon in the same boat as well, too. So it's important that when you're buying a camera and you're getting into this for the first time, it's great to just jump in and get started with it. But read that manual. Overlook all of the features on your camera. Get a good general understanding of where things are located so that way when it's your time to really get involved and invested in this, you know exactly what to do and what to look for. So that's my step one. Now let's move a little bit further in. For those that are getting better at this, now next week we really talk about editing, but for those that are feeling like they are now ready to kind of jump in and edit their photography, whether that be on the automatic setting, or whether that be the things that we're talking about today, these are some of the editing softwares that I might recommend. Um, Photoshop, Lightroom are both ran by Adobe. Fantastic programs give you a lot to work with. Tools, um, AI technology, etc. There's a lot of really amazing things you can do on there. Um, only downside is you pay a monthly installment or a monthly fee on these apps. It's not just a one-time buy and then you own the product or you can license the product. It's a monthly fee. Whereas Capture One Pro, Corel, Paint Shop Pro, you both pay a one-time fee for those and then you can uh, continue to add on or do things as you progress with the apps. But those are all great tools or resources to look into, especially if you're feeling like now after either shooting on automatic or everything we're going to talk about in a little bit here, you're past that. Now it might be time to start editing your photographs. And again, next week we'll jump a little bit further into detail on those. Now, we talked about it last week, and I ended on with the mode dial, we're going to stick to automatic. But let's refresh before we jump into the kind of modes or the different things for a camera. As you can see, all three of these mode dials look a little different, and this is where it's important to see what camera you have exactly. Because automatic is going to be automatic, but you've got other settings on the camera that can be used or can be functional to you. Um, but if you don't know how to use them, then it might not be important or it might not be something that you're aware of when you're shooting. And it could be very important. Your next steps. We started with automatic. There's also program automatic. There's our aperture priority, our shutter priority, and our full manual. Now I believe... Nope. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. So automatic, we know automatic. That's what I've told you guys to stick with last week. That is the bare bones for your camera. You're allowing the camera to use its technology any way that the camera seems fit. To think about it, the camera doesn't recognize that you're looking at a dog or that your kids are in front of a painting somewhere at a museum. The camera recognizes light and it picks up on lights, darks, and midtones. From there, the automatic sensor in the camera balances all of those out between its ISO, its f-stop, and its shutter. And when you pull that trigger, you're getting a combination of the camera doing all of those functionalities, figuring out how to balance the light without giving you this very white or very dark photo. Program Automatic does all those same things, but now you can customize things a little bit. If you want to change the white balance, if you want to change the light metering, if you want to change the focusing zone, if you want to, oh man, what's the words I'm looking for? Um, if you want to change the uh, uh, frame, uh, yeah, the, the, the ratio for the frame, those are all things that you can do on program automatic. And there's a plethora more of things depending on the camera that you're using. The camera still shoots automatically. You just frame up the subject and do what you want. But now you have some more access over the settings that you did not have during automatic. So if you feel like you're past automatic and you don't want to get into the full manual or aperture shutter priority, program auto might be a great option for you. Aperture priority is just as it says, the priority on that setting is your aperture. So all other settings will be automatic, ran by the camera, but you're going to be controlling the aperture. And we're going to go over exactly what aperture is in the next couple slides. Shutter priority, same idea. Rather than you controlling everything, you're letting the camera control almost everything on the camera, but you're just controlling that shutter speed at which the camera is opening and closing. And then full manual, meaning you have control over everything. Now, on full manual, you can set auto on certain things like ISO, 
um, and other settings on there too. However, you don't have to, and you can actually control and manipulate all of that as you're shooting, which a lot of professional photographers or people who are more, let's say, advanced hobbyists even, or intermediate shooters, that's what they're going to be doing is full manual. Now, I mentioned things like aperture, shutter, and ISO a couple times throughout this whole presentation, but what do those really mean? And they all come together and they form what we call the exposure triangle. Now, this doesn't do it like a pyramid style, but a lot of diagrams that you see out there that talk about the exposure triangle show it as just that. It's a pyramid where all three are different sides. All three of these are different sides of the pyramid. However, they all work independently but together at the same time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to break down all three of these for you, how they're separate, how they come together, and then we'll look at some examples to see really what all of this means so that way we make more sense of it. But our exposure triangle is basically the basis for if you ever shot with a film camera or maybe even an earlier DSLR, this was the basis for the film. You would buy your film, let's say you went to Walgreens, you bought a thing of Kodak 400. Well, where ISO shows the number, that's its sensitivity towards the light. And like I said, we'll explain more on ISO as we keep moving. But the sensitivity towards light was what that number on the film was. So if you bought Kodak 400, your ISO was 400. From there, depending on your light, your subject matter, your background to foreground relationship, you would adjust the numbers on the camera accordingly so that way you got the proper shot for what you were trying to do. So in this case, if you shot on film or a DSLR, you already really have the basis for what we're about to talk about. And it seems complex, but as we break everything down individually, I hopefully this will help kind of make more sense of it all. So first and foremost, let's jump into aperture. What is aperture? Aperture is your background to foreground relationship. It is your ability to separate the background from the foreground. Now when we look at lenses, you're usually going to see that the lens has a number on there. So it'll say, you know, this is a 50 millimeter lens. Next to that though, it might say that it has an F stop of maybe 1.4 or 2.8 or 4. What that's referring to is the maximum aperture that you are able to hit on that given lens. Now some lenses, some kit lenses, will have something like a 4.5 to 5.6 or 5.6 up to 6. All that means is it's a variable, meaning if you're at whatever the lowest number is, let's say it's 18 to 35 is your lens. When you're at 18, you're at that 4.3 that they're telling you. But as soon as you start to zoom in and you hit that 35, well, that's where you're going to jump up to 6. So that's what that's referring to. If your lens says that it's f2 or f1.4 or 2.8, just know that you have a continuous maximum f-stop of 2.8 throughout the whole zooming process or throughout the entirety of that uh, prime lens. What that means is that your maximum number is whatever it says on the lens. So when we look at this chart, if we look at f22, one of the highest numbers on a lens, we'll notice that the f22 clearly shows both the background and the foreground. So we see our gentleman standing in front of the pyramid, and that is going to be our completely open f-stop. Hi there, guys. Welcome in. We didn't want you just to be talking to a screen. No, you're fine. I appreciate it, Jeff. <laughs> we just got in a minute ago, so you haven't missed much. So at the F22, what we're noticing there is that we're going to see the background and the foreground in its entirety. What that does for us is allows us to get the entire subject in view. So if you've got your family with you, you guys are on vacation, you're in front of the pyramids, you want to get a nice clean shot, you're not going to use something super low like an F1.4. Because the whole point of that f1.4 is to blur the background out completely, so our main focus is on the subject matter. If we look from f22 to f1.4, the background is almost completely gone, only a shadow of it remains. So the higher that f-stop, the more of the background and foreground we're going to get. The lower that f-stop goes, the more we're going to blur things out. So when we read a lens that says 50 millimeter f1.4, that means it's maximum, the lowest or highest, if you will, that we can go is that 1.4. We can go down to 22, giving us more background, giving us more relationship between the two, or we can blur the background out if that's the effect that we're trying to go for. And if we don't want to blur it completely out, 
we can look at the second line where we see f8, f5.6, f4, where we can still kind of see the background, but we're still getting blur effects on there. Now, this is the chart for it. Let's look at a couple examples to make sure we understand what this is. So, we have two images right here. We've got the dogs on the left and then the squirrel on the right. If we're to start with the dogs, we can clearly see the main dog in the front. Their nose is up nice and focused. We can see all the ridges and cracks on there. We can see the fur, the whiskers, even a little bit of snot in the nose. But when we look behind the, the dog's nose, we can see that there is another dog behind him or her, and we can't see that dog in complete stillness or clarity. So if we go back to our chart, we're most likely looking at something closer to F5.6, maybe F8, where we can still make out that there is a background there, but we can't make out the exact details. Now, certain details like that could be, where is the dog looking? Is the dog looking directly at us? Is it looking off to the side? Is someone squeaking a toy in the distance and that's what they're paying attention to? Or is their owner behind the camera and they're just having a good day? We can't tell, but we can tell it's a dog. So that's what we get with that blur effect right there. So is this determined by the lens or? Not necessarily. No, on the well, yes and no. So on your lens, like I was saying earlier, you're going to see a number on the lens. So that yeah. could be 50 millimeter. That could be, um, you know, 24 to 70 millimeter. Then you're going to see a maximum f-stop number on there. Oh, so that's the maximum. That's, that's the maximum. For this one. So certain lenses, especially telephoto, mm -hmm. if it's a better telephoto product, you're going to see 2.8 being the maximum f-stop for that one. If you're buying a prime lens, like a 50 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 85 millimeter, the single numbers that have no zoom, that's where they can have lower f-stops. So you can see something all the way down to f1.2. Um, so ahead. if it says f1.4 or f2.8, what is the other range? You go up from there. Oh, so that's the bottom, that's the floor. It, technically, they call it the maximum f-stop. Oh, so it's yeah. the other way. So the higher the number, the more of the background you're getting. Okay. All so lenses can give you a high number. Okay. That's, oh, that's okay. Nice. So this one says, this is the telly lens that mm -hmm. I have. This is, says f4.5 to 6.3. Meaning that your maximum aperture on there is 4.5, and as you zoom on there, it's going to turn into 6. So if you have it set to the highest number, which would be 4, 4.5, as you start to zoom and bring it to the telephoto and start to really zoom into your item, yeah. it, the number will change on the camera. Okay. So it'll go from a 4.5 to 6. So, uh, so changing it on oh. here? Exactly. Is... You'll see it. So if you just started to zoom out and pointed your camera down, it'll go from a 4 to a 6 if you've got it at the lowest setting. Okay, but what about this one here if I, if I have it on the A setting? Like well, that's about. automatic. So then the camera's just going to do all the work for you. No, no. Because if this A is for the aperture... Oh, you have it on the aperture, then yeah. yeah. So if I put it on the aperture and then I change the number here, it says F22. Does that not matter what, blend, what the lens says? No, they're all going to have 22. They're all going to have that number on there. But it's just they're going to have a maximum number, which is what that 4.5 to 6 is. So you can't go lower or higher, if you will, than those numbers. So you won't be able to get a 2.8. You can't get a 1.4 on there. That's what that lens is limited to. Okay. So if background blur is important to you, if changing the relationship between background and foreground is important, you're not going to really have that with that lens. Okay. So that's more of your kit lens. With some of the other bigger telephotos or some of the more premium telephotos, they have a continuous 2.8 the whole time. So if you were to start at, let's say that's a uh, 18 to 135. If you're at 18 and you zoom into 135, it would stay 2.8 the whole time. But in your case, when you start at whatever the lowest number is, let's say it's an 18, it's going to start at 4.5 if you bring it all the way down. Okay. As you zoom to get further distance, it's going to change from 4.5 to 6. Okay. And there's no way you can go back unless you unzoom, basically. Okay. Okay. Um, so all lenses can hit a high number like 22, okay. but that maximum number that we're talking about is the lowest number that your camera can hit, okay. the most background to foreground separation that you can get. So like inside, like I'm looking at it thinking like a lot of the pictures that I had had the blur background, but I wanted like the whole picture so I can get the whole picture. I yeah. just can't get the blur is like. Yeah, the blur is going to be the harder one oh. to get. So go to 22. Next time you're doing that, yeah. go up to 22, yeah. 16. Right. The, the bigger you go, well, first to even explain more to it too, the way that the f stops work are very similar to the way that our iris or our eyeball works. When you're in the sunlight, your eye gets really, really small, and that's because it lets in less light. 
when you're indoors and you're in a dark situation, like right when you wake up, that's why it hurts so much when light hits you. It's because your iris is all the way open and your eye is mainly all black now. Camera lens kind of functions the same way. It's got its, um, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? I can't think of what the metal's called on the inside. Basically, you've got this cylindrical shape or a spherical shape that is metal shutters are opening and closing, making that smaller or bigger. The bigger the number, the bigger the, the iris gets with the lower numbers. So you're going to let in a lot more light when you get the lo uh, lower numbers. But with that, you're going to also get more background blur. If we make the circle smaller, we're going to see the background and the foreground in complete focus. But now we've got to change other settings on our cameras. If we're only doing the aperture priority, the camera's automatically going to adjust everything else. So all you're focused on are these numbers. Okay. So, going back to that example, so I would probably say that the dog in the background there is closest to an F maybe 8 or 5.6, maybe 4 at the least. Um, but 2.8 would definitely blur it out too much, and going down from there would definitely blur too much out. When we look at our squirrel on the other hand, we can clearly see it's a squirrel. We can clearly see that it's on some sort of branch or piece of wood or something's going on. We can see that it's eating but we can't see the background at all. Now we can see the green, we can see the different shades of green, probably what looks like more branches on the tree. So in theory, this is probably more foliage right behind the squirrel. It's more of like a bush or a tree setting. However, we can't clearly make it out. So if that's the case, we probably could say this is closer to a 2.8, maybe 1.4, where we're still able to see the colors of the background, but not necessarily what exactly the background is. For all we know, there could be another squirrel back there. There could be maybe a, you know, this could be a forest preserve or a, uh, a reserve of some sort, so there might be some form of parking lot behind it, but we have no clue. The other thing that Aperture is gonna be great for is what we call bokeh. Now, bokeh or bokeh dots come from this idea that if you blur things out enough in the background and your main subject is in focus, you can cause the background to turn into these smaller dots of color. And you can kind of see exactly over there. Most likely those lights behind this little Lego figure are Christmas lights, just stacked up and kind of bunched up and draped over. But it gives this really cool effect on the camera itself. So if that's something that you're interested in, you need a lens that at least gets to 1.8, 1.4, 1.2 .1 in order to get that severe of a background blur. Now, why use aperture priority mode instead of just full manual when it comes to these settings? And this would be a great example of why. You might get these scenarios where you're going in and out of maybe famous buildings or you're on vacation and you're in and out of different environments, indoors, outdoors, bad lighting, good lighting. You're not as concerned about the speed of your shutter because you don't have really a lot of subjects that are moving, but you are concerned about either getting a perfect portrait or getting a whole scenic picture. Um, so this would be a nice example where you have a lady standing in front of a beautiful background, you've got water, you've got a waterfall over there, a city off in the distance, gorgeous sunset, and all of these multicolored rocks everywhere that just pop out at you. You probably don't want to lose that background when you're taking that picture, so you probably want to shoot on something like an F-22. But maybe you're not concerned about the background, you've already got a couple shots, but you just want to get a picture of the wife or your daughter or your girlfriend or what have you, then maybe we blur the background out and, out and start focusing on that perfect portrait. So using aperture priority mode, you're not as concerned about the movement of your subject, your lighting is not something that you're concerned about, really all you're concerned about is the relationship between the background and the foreground that you're having. I'm going to review one more time. So some lenses can go all the way up to f32. That F32 is going to show everything. So we can see we have a parking lot in the distance with a garbage can sitting there. We've got a body of water and then two trees. From there, if we go to F16, we start to lose that background a little bit. Not enough that we can't see it anymore. If you squint hard enough, it makes sense. F6.3, now it's getting a little tough. That blue garbage can starts to disappear a little bit. And, but it does still look like something's right there, that it doesn't look normal. And then 2.8, we now lose everything. We can see the tree in the foreground, we can see that color on there, the white bark, the brown, the red, but we lose the background to a point now where 
don't know exactly what's over there unless we have the other images next to it. Shutter speed. So the S or the TV on your camera, or yes. Yeah, it's A or AV for aperture priority and S or TV for shutter priority. I don't know what the T stands for, um, but I know the S stands for shutter. Anyway, the way that this works is that we're looking at, uh, a, a, uh, we're looking at a, a passing of time of one second. So keep a one second in your mind. Counting to one second, one one thousand. When we're doing that with a camera, what we're basically doing is we're taking that divided by the speed at which we want our shutter to now close. So when we look at the shutter speeds on our camera, if we're on the shutter speed priority, the 125 option is 125th of a second. The 250 is going to be 250th of a second. 500, same thing, and then as you get lower, 1 and 15th of a second, 1 eighth of a second, 1 fourth, 1 half a, or half a second. All that's doing is it's slowing down the amount of time it takes for the shutter to open and close to get your image. So in this case, or in this scene, we have a stick figure that's running. One in 500 gets that perfectly still. The image is clear, we don't have any issues, we can see the image fully. As we start to go slower and slower with our shutter speed, we're gonna see that the complexion or the color or the actual figure itself starts to become more blurred. And that is because we are shutting our camera at a slower pace, therefore the object in movement isn't becoming perfectly still on the frame. More, the slower the shutter goes, the more detail that you get. The more that the camera has to take in, but the more movement that's there, the more aggravation or the more blur we're going to get from the physical photo. So in the case of the guy running here, one in five hundredths of a second is a perfect pace to make sure we get everything in full detail. Whereas when we get down to that half second, or really where it starts is that one in thirtieth of a second, we start to get this big motion blur on there. So making sure we set our shutter appropriate for what we're taking pictures of is important in this case. Some examples that I have of that. Before I have examples, freezing action. If you are doing something with lots of sports, with lots of movement, lots of action, so surfing, snowboarding, uh, motocross, um, you know, if your kid's in football or track and they're running down the field, those are all things that have very quick action that at any point in time you can miss getting that picture. We want to make sure that we get this freezing action shot. So one in a thousand or faster is going to be what's recommended when you have high speed or high sport or lots of movement, if you will. Is everything going to be in focus? Not necessarily. The idea to think about is that we want to make sure we're freezing our action or the most important part of our image. So in this case, our surfer would be our most important part. Now, we're probably not trying to just take pictures of water and then a surfer appears out of nowhere. We're probably taking a picture of the surfer. Now, the surfer is probably going to move at a very rapid pace. So we want to make sure we set our shutter speed to the appropriate amount. However, we're going to still have some blur going on, but the blur that's coming from this image is mainly from the water itself. It's from the white tips of the water as it's splashing, as it's thrashing, and from that we have motion blur on the water, yet our surfer is in perfect stillness. So making sure that we set our, our speed doesn't necessarily give us a completely non-blurry image, but that should at least give us the ability to make sure that the picture we're taking if that's the surfer, if it's a whale, or if it's whatever it is in the water, we're getting that in perfect freezing action, and everything else might have a little blur to it. Never be upset about a little blur, it's usually not that big of a deal. However, if the entire image is blurry, that's a different story. The other reason why we might do something that's at one in a thousand speed is to give something a sense of motion. In this case, we have a hummingbird. Hummingbirds move their wings so incredibly fast. They tend to hover over whatever it is that they're trying to eat or drink or whatever it is, and they basically just get a little closer and back up, but their movements are super sporadic. Their wings are fluttering at a really high fr uh, frame rate. So when we take photos of hummingbirds, for the most part, it's almost impossible to get a, a hummingbird perfectly still because of how fast their wings are going. Um, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. 
when we look at this image, we can see that the wings have a little bit of blur and motion to them. Yet when we look at the bird, we can see the beautiful greens, browns, yellows, and that orange beak that really distinguish the color of the feathering and everything else that's going on. So using a higher shutter speed might not give us a perfectly still image, similar to our surfers, but it'll create a sense of motion, and if we shoot it and operate it correctly, it should give us the gratification of colors or scenery or whatever it is that we're looking for. So again, motion blur is not necessarily a bad thing. Too much of it can be disorienting to look at after a while, but just the right amount might be enough to sell or to push whatever idea that you have for your photo. What do you think that I mean, for this guy, probably one in 2,000th of a second. I was, gonna, I was just looking at the settings on this camera, and it like, goes pretty high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for, uh, for Sony, for Canon, any of the mirrorless cameras, ISO and shutter speed are much higher than your yeah, standard. Like, I'm like looking, like, what would one in 8,000, what would you need to take? It depends. Off? Depends on what you're using. Depends yeah. on the lens. Um, you might see, like, a one in 8,000 for, like, a NASCAR shooting, okay. where if someone's trying to get the cars that are going 300 miles around the track, yeah. that might be the reason for okay. it. Um, but for something like this, I'd say... Oh, definitely over a thousand, probably close to that two thousand range would be perfect. Now we talk about the uh, about shutter giving us then more saturation the longer that it's open. We call those long exposures. The longer that we keep the shutters open for, the more effect we're going to get as far as colors and saturation goes. So when we look at a picture like this. We can see how beautiful the foliage looks. You can see the different shades of green, some of the brown parts where the plants are dying. You can see the rocks and all the deep shadows and pockets that are on there. The moss is super green, but also shades in and out. Um, and then you have the water. And the water has this nice, beautiful flow to it, but at the same time, it feels like it's a little blurry in certain parts. And the idea to think about with this is the fact that water is physically moving and it's not moving in the same exact path the whole time. There are paths where we see this water in the same kind of streak and it almost looks like a fog or a haze. What's happening is that we're keeping a long exposure on the camera. Long exposure can be as long as, or as short as a second. It could be as long as two minutes. It depends on what we're trying to go for. The longer we keep those shutters open, the more color that we're going to get. But the hard part with this is that the more things that move, the more blur that's created, but then also the more that we move, the more blur that's created. So with a photo like this, I would imagine that it's either sitting on a rock or it's sitting on a tripod. The person that took this picture probably left it open for maybe 30, 45 seconds. And from there, the water itself has blur to it because the water's moving. But the green, the foliage, the rocks, everything has this perfectly still nature to it, but also a beautiful color. So we're creating this really nice mood, there are a lot of dramatic colors on there, things are popping off. But then we also have this beautiful waterfall that gives the sense of motion, but also then helps create the mood too. So how do you take a picture like that with the shutter open like for 30 seconds? You, you hit the button and you go to the correct. You go to the correct setting on the camera. So the shut. Okay, so like there's the, long exposure shutters oh, on there. As long, if you keep going through, you'll see that one in eight thousand. Just keep uh -huh. going or yeah. go the other direction. So, so, but what I'm saying is, like, if you put it on a tripod and you you snap the picture, it would you would just hit the button once and it would just. Yeah. As long as you have it set to that proper shutter. Shutter. Yeah. Okay. That, I've never done that. That's why I'm like curious. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another one on there called B, and that's bulb. And actually, bulb will stay open for as long as you want. It used to be a setting on their mode dial. Now they've changed it where it's in the uh, shutter speed settings. But you can set it to B. B is going to keep it open continuously until you press that button again. Another example, some long exposure. So in this case, we have a guy standing in front of a train. We can see the lights that are zipping past him. That is the train itself. But we've got his red jacket, his bike with the mud all over the tire, the green color or the teal color on the bike, the concrete ceiling of this train station and platform. All of those colors are very vibrant. They're rich. They're saturated. Um, yet the train, because it's moving, is going to create kind of these um, whisks of light. And that light is going to give us the sense that something's moving in front of him. 
However, if we look through those lights, we can actually see behind what was ever there for the train. We can see a sign in the background, some street lamps. So those little parts where we can see the train through the center of the train, the separations, that's giving us enough information to the camera during this long exposure that the camera can basically tell you exactly what's behind the train, if that makes sense, because we have those breaks in between. But we have beautiful color, we have oversaturation, um, we have deep shadows, nice light parts on there. So this is another good example of just letting the camera be open for an extended period of time to give a sense of either motion or to capture the color and everything else that we're looking for. Why use shutter priority? I like using this photo. This is one I got emailed by a customer one time. The reason we're using shutter priority is to make sure that we get a good picture instead of this one. Um, this is a great example of some frisbee that's going on, I believe at not Grant Park, but the, I think Lincoln Park actually. So there's the soccer fields over there. Customer basically wasn't sure why they couldn't get a good picture during the night when these guys are playing a game. And it really came down to either two things. One, their ISO, which we're going to talk about next, or their speed of their shutter, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. Controlling that speed so that we were getting freezing action and we're not just getting photos that look like this where they're extremely blurry and you can't really tell what's going on. So again, to review, when we have things that are moving fast or we need to stop the motion, we want to use either shutter priority or we want in the full manual settings to change our speed to be faster. Typically in the world of photography, one in a thousandth or faster is the perfect for high speed speeding or high speed action that we're trying to freeze. In the case of this guy here, he's doing a trick off of a bike, he's probably in the middle of the air, you're only in the air for probably about three seconds with gravity and then you're coming down, so you have a short time as a photographer to get this image. So being on shutter priority, setting it to a speed that's appropriate for this, and maybe even using burst photography so that way you're getting a couple images instead of just one picture at a time would be a good idea for this. So ISO. ISO is important, and I think I explained this in the very beginning of the class. The best way to think about ISO is the same way we would think about film. When we look at a container of film, it'll usually tell us a number, say like Kodak 100, uh, Fuji Film 400. Um, and there's a few other brands that aren't popping into my head right now. But basically what that means is that the film's sensitivity towards light is rated at whatever number it is. Now in the digital and mirrorless world of cameras, we have the ability to set our ISO to be whatever we want. It's kind of like thinking about that you have an, uh, a roll of film in your camera that can be manipulated and changed into whatever ISO you want at any given time. What ISO is doing for us is it's taking the sensitivity of our camera sensor and making it more or less sensitive towards light. How that then affects our picture is that we're going to get more saturation or maybe less saturation but more light spots on our physical photos. So when we go from the ISO 100, everything is dark. It has more of a gloomy, doomy kind of atmosphere. We're not getting the beautiful colors of the sunset that we're seeing there on the beach. Uh, we're really just getting the dark aspects kind of overpowering everything. When we get to 200, we really can see the beautiful colors of the background. We see the nice reflection in the water, but it's still kind of dark. We get to 400, we can see the beach clearly, the sky has beautiful colors, excuse me, and we also have a beautiful reflection coming off the water. At 800, more color in the background. The beach is a little bit lighter. The water itself is really showing off the reflection of both the pier and also the purple and blues and reds from the skyline itself during the sunset. So in this case, we have the same shutter and aperture for each of these photos but we have a different ISO. So if you're in a dark environment, bumping your ISO up is probably going to be an appropriate thing to do. It'll help bring more light into the camera, giving you more options on what to play with as far as your aperture or shutter. Now, if you're not a fan of that, you can always do auto ISO. We'll talk about that in a second. 
While ISO is great for giving us more, let's say, light saturation into the camera, it can also be bad because we get what's called noise. ISO and noise go hand in hand. Um, best way to think about noise is it's very similar to that feeling or sight of seeing the spark, uh, seeing the um, snow on a TV. You're going to get these areas of dark and light that basically look like a scatter graph all over your photo. And you're going to get what's called grain or noise. And basically all that is is that you made your photo too sensitive or your camera too sensitive for the light. There's a lot of light going on the photo or enough light that the camera says this is too sensitive and then they make a picture that looks like this. It's kind of a nice checks and balance too for you. But in this case, there's enough light around the Empire State Building that the photographer only needed to use ISO 100. When they tried to bump up to 3200, that was enough ISO that it didn't affect the picture itself, but now we have all this extra noise which in turn does change the way that the picture reads and looks. So keep that in mind when we're shooting. If we have a lot of light going on, less ISO is better than more ISO because more ISO in a very well-lit environment can lead to this grainy, noisy picture. Now, auto ISO exists, and by automatically shooting an automatic, you already have it. Uh, have it. However, some people like to shoot on manual and don't want to change their ISO. What you can do in any of the settings is make ISO uh, automatic. And as the, you're going, the camera will dictate how much light that it sees in front of it. And from there, then, it will generate its own number for ISO. And you're controlling either the shutter, the aperture, or both. So I like to personally use auto ISO. And the reason I fell into it is because I look at it this way. If I'm doing an event photography, uh, or if I'm doing some photography for an event, um, for example, I volunteer for the Chicago Polar Bear Club every year. I do all their photos. First beginning part of my day at 9, 8 in the morning, I get in the water, I take pictures of people as they're jumping into the lake. Usually it's a dreary day, there's no sunlight out there. From there then we go to a bar for an after party, we do raffles, so we're indoors, we've got bad iridescent or can lighting. So we're going from one area to another area, and I've got to capture pictures in between. Rather than sitting there and changing my ISO on my camera, I run it on automatic. And what that allows for is that the camera gets to decide and read the light in the situations that we're in. If it notices an overcast day, it'll turn the ISO maybe up to 300 or 400. But if it notices that we're indoors and the lighting is, you know, 12 feet off the ground, off banisters, then it might raise it up to 1,000 or 1,200 because it's trying to compensate for the light that it's missing. So auto ISO is one of my personal favorite things to use on the camera because it's one less thing I need to be conscious of when I'm shooting. And I think that most modern cameras do a really good job of giving you the proper light as long as you're using that setting appropriately. The other example I have, um, prom, prom season always comes around. I get moms or dads who are like, oh, I'm going to do my kids' photography for it. I'm going to take pictures of them. And they always ask, what's the setting that I should keep on? And I always recommend keeping auto ISO. The reason why is that if you're going to be outdoors taking pictures in front of gardens or cool areas and then you're going to go indoor by someone's fireplace or where the venue is for prom, then you're going to be constantly going in and outdoors. So rather than have to sit there and change your ISO every single time, you can just set it to auto and then control the other features on the camera. So is the ISO what you would change when you want to do really low lighting? Yeah, that's one of the things that you can change. I mean, if, I mean like this one goes really high. With the Exactly. So the higher the number, the more sensitive it is. So the higher the number, the better it should be for very low light photography. Is it better to choose like auto ISO like when you're in doubt? I would say so. I mean, the other thing you can look at too, and I think we talked about it last week, was that info button on your camera, where after you hit the playback button and you look at all your photos, usually on the bottom of the photo, if you press info or you select that photo, it'll tell you what settings that the camera used. So. If let's say you get a really great picture and you were using auto ISO, but you want to try to understand exactly what your camera is doing for you, click that, click the photo that you like, click info, and it should tell you that, oh, the camera used uh, ISO 200. And from there you can kind of dictate, okay, well, there's a lot of sun coming down, there was no clouds, um, the picture I was taking of was underneath some shade, so it looks like the camera adjusted itself to 200 
in order for me to get that lighting. So auto ISO, when in doubt, I would use it. Personally, I keep my auto ISO on all the time. There's only one camera that I shoot on where I keep it at 800 no matter what the setting is. Uh, but that's because I'm also pursuing it to look more like film. So everyone has to pick and choose that battle. To review everything before we look at some examples and I break down what I see, we have our f-stop, our shutter, and our ISO on another form of exposure triangle. When we look at our f-stop, we start at f-16 where we have two stuffed piggies on a couch. As we move down to f1.4, that background's getting blurred out, but we still have our pigs in focus. With our shutter speed, we start at one in a thousandth speed. We can see that the hammer is clearly in this person's hand and it is swinging towards the nail. But as we start to slow our shutter down, we're going to slowly but surely get more blur on the photos to the point where when we get to half a second, we can't even tell if that is a hammer and a hand moving. Now, the other thing you'll notice too, as we change our shutter speed, we are getting darker and darker images. So the faster that we go, depending on our f-stop or depending on our ISO, we might realize that the lower that we go with the number, the slower we go, the more or the less light that we're really getting into the camera, which you think would be the opposite. But that's where knowing those manual controls versus using just aperture or shutter are extremely important because they really can tell you exactly what you're doing and how to do it. And if you can remember certain situations where you set your camera up because you had XYZ lighting, or you were taking pictures of this and there was movement or there was something going on, that's where then we can really adjust and make sure that we're setting the appropriate settings for ourselves. Um, so yes, for example, when we look at this image, we see that the hammer is moving. We see that the as it's swinging, the slower we go, the more um, blur that we're getting. But the slower we go, the darker we're getting. The opposite is to be said for something like ISO, where the lower that number is, the darker, the more saturated, the more color that we're getting. So for this penny, we can see that it's on a wood table of some sort, and we can see the nice black wood, and we can see the half the penny, or a quarter of the penny, if you will. As we start to jack that number up, up to ISO 2500, we can see that the penny and the floor, or the wood, gets really pixelated, gets noisy, gets blurry. That's because we've turned our ISO up too high for what the saturation that's needed for that photo. ISO 100, ISO 250 is probably more than enough for a photo like this where you have a really dark wood, but you have this brass penny that also has some reflection and color and shine to it. Now all three of these can be separate, all three of these can come together. We're going to talk about what together would look like on some of these example images. So before I do that, one last thing to talk about on this is the exposure meter. So on your camera, you're going to have something that looks like this, where it'll have 1, plus 2, 1, minus 2, or minus 1, minus 2, plus 1, plus 2. What this basically is, is your exposure meter for when you're taking pictures. If, so the best way to describe this, ISO takes the sensitivity of your image, takes the sensitivity of your sensor, and it says, okay, I'm reading all of these very light points on here, so I'm going to turn your image very light or very dark, depending on that, unless you're using automatic, then the camera will dictate for you. With exposure, though, we're not taking the brightest parts of the image, we're not looking for the lights. What we're looking to do is take the frame or the entirety of the image and make it lighter or darker. So by going the minus section on the exposure meter on our camera, we're going to get darker, uh, a darker frame. By going to the plus section of our frame, we're going to get a darker frame, or a lighter frame, I should say. Yes, a lighter frame. Good for situations where if we've set our ISO, we've set our f-stop, we've set our shutter, but we're still getting either overly dark or overly light images, we might want to then play with exposure so that way we can take the entirety of the frame and make it lighter or darker. Now full manual, like I said earlier, that gives you control over both aperture and shutter speed as well as ISO. You can use all those things separately depending on what you like, but you can also use them all together. 
Now, personally, when I shoot, I mainly only shoot on aperture priority. And I like shooting on the aperture priority. I don't have any issue with full manual. I fully know how to do it. I respect it. But at this point in time, I feel like the cameras that are coming out nowadays are extremely powerful. They can do a lot of work for us. And at this point, I'm more concerned about getting the composition and the image bright, because then I can always go in and post and edit and change things as I feel free, um, or as I feel fit to do so. So for me, I personally use the aperture priority, but I, I am known at sporting events or other places, if I see movement, I will switch to shutter because I don't want to miss out on any of those. Uh, again, you can use them separately, but full manual is going to give you control over both. And that's where then you get into these conundrums where you're changing the numbers and setting everything. Well, if I put my aperture to f22, my shutter's at one, one in a thousand of speed, it might be too fast, I might be letting in too much light, so maybe I need to set and change it up a little bit more to get what I'm looking for. And if your settings are everywhere that you need to go between your ISO, your f-stop, and your shutter, then it might be a time to go examine that exposure to make sure that we have our frame either lighter or darker depending on what our other settings are. It's hard to explain or it's hard to, to quantify any of this for, oh, you should have it set for this when you're in this setting or you should have it set for this when you're in that setting. A lot of the times with when it comes to ISO, f-stop, shutter, and exposure, it's all touch and feel. It's all you going out, taking photos, checking to see what the camera decided for you, and then from there making your educated guesses as time goes on. They make apps, they make all sorts of stuff where then your phone camera can gravitate and sense different stuff. Um, I used to use them on my film cameras back in the day when I was really getting back into film so much. I thought it was awesome that you could do that. However, I learned quickly that, number one, it's cumbersome to have your phone out all the time, scanning for what lighting and colors and everything else you should have. But two, as you're practicing and as you keep shooting with the camera, it all kind of folds into itself and it all makes more sense. So practice is gonna be the best way to figure out how you should be using things like your shutter, your aperture, and your ISO, whether that's all separately or whether you're mixing them all together to get the image that you're trying to get. The exposure meter mm -hmm. is this, right? Yes. So for in the auto mode, mm -hmm. does it change? In the auto, no. Uh, unless you're using program auto, which is that uh, P, okay. or whether you're using aperture or shutter priority. So what should this be at if you're just if in you auto? I just leave it at zero. But it doesn't matter where you move it because it won't do anything. Okay. Yeah. Not until you're in the other settings. Okay. Um, some cameras, they you, you'll notice right away if you ding it on accident, that's where you'll see that it gets really light or really dark, no matter what settings you turn on. Um, some I did something to this yesterday that was it was weird, and it was like everything was really dark in there, and I was like trying to do pictures at the dance competition. I'm like, I don't know what I did, so I just flipped it to auto because I was like, could I, could be that if that's I, I if that's the case, then what I would do is always just check that dial and make sure it's at zero. So for the next couple slides, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the image. I'm going to explain the three settings that I see, the uh, ISO, the shutter, and then the um, f-stop. And I'll explain why I, I'm calling those numbers out. So I'll start with f-stop on this one. This one is probably going to be somewhere between an f32 all the way to f16. You've got the foreground, which would be these pipes and this metal on this bridge. But then we also have the background, and all of it is in full focus. We can see everything clearly. There's really little to no blurring on this one. So I'd say anywhere between 32 or 22, if you will, to 16, because that's what most modern lenses are doing, 22 being the highest. From there, ISO to me is a little higher. And the reason I'm picking up on a higher ISO, I probably would put this at maybe an 800 or 900 ISO, is because if I look at these windows and lights, they're very bright, they feel very oversaturated, and areas like underneath my pillars, or on the bridge itself, I can see noise, I can see pixelation. So it would lead me to believe that the ISO is turned up a little too high, but that's what's giving us this really nice dramatic color on the bricks and on the roof, where we can see all of this stuff in full detail, but it has more of this dark dramaticism. As far as shutter goes for this, because of how dark all of that is, I imagine this was probably shot on a tripod because of the symmetry that we're seeing too. Therefore, the shutter speed probably would be a little bit longer. I'm not saying it's long exposure, 
Long exposure can also give you very washed out windows. However, because I see this ISO kind of noise up there, I don't think that's what it's from. But as far as the actual picture itself, I probably would say this is maybe one in 125th or slower for the shutter speed. Got some cherry blossoms. First thing, I can see that the branches of cherry blossoms in the foreground are clear and we can see everything. Even all the little petals and all the other little things that pop out of plants, I don't know that that well. But when I look at the background, I can't see everything on there. It's blurred out. It's not existent as much. So that would lead me to believe that this background is probably closer to an F5 or 6, something where the background's blurred, but you can obviously tell that those are more branches full of cherry blossoms. From there, the lighting on this is pretty amazing. There doesn't look to be any shadows dropping down unless it's the part that's aren't faced towards the sun. So the sun is coming from our upper right corner and then shining down onto our plants. In that case, our ISO doesn't need to be high because we're not getting a lot of uh, darkness in this photo. So probably an ISO of 100 is perfectly fine on this one, one of the lower ones that you can choose. As far as shutter goes, if there's not a lot of movement, so there's not a lot of wind or outside kind of pressure on these cherry blossoms that would cause them to violently move back and forth, the shutter speed is probably also pretty slow to begin with, or pretty, yeah, slow to begin with. Typically, around a standard picture, 1 in 125th of a second, 1 in 250th of a second is kind of that, like, central area that you'd be in before you get into something that's really slow or really fast. So I imagine this photo would be around there, too. Uh, so you wouldn't use, like, 500,000 for, like, these photos? No, because I don't have a lot of movement in here. Unless, like I, like I was saying, unless there's a lot, like, a really violent wind is coming through, or, you know, maybe... These kids are messing with the tree and pushing it back and forth. Then maybe I would use something like a one in a five hundredths, but definitely not one in a thousandth because I don't have a lot of movement happening here. So I don't need my shutter to close and open so quickly. I can give it a little bit more time. Got two firemen that are walking. It's a dramatic photo. Now this could be a stage picture. This also could be something that they took a picture of maybe before a call or what have you, but either way, you've got the gentleman in front and you've got another fireman behind them. We can clearly tell that's a fireman based on their outfit, based on the helmet, based on the little Nokia walkie-talkie that's clipped onto his, uh, his, his pack. However, we can't tell where that fireman's looking. Are they looking directly at us? Are they looking towards the other fireman? So we have good blur on this one. This is similar to the dog photo we were looking at earlier. So this would also probably be in that F8, or sorry, F4, maybe F5.6, but I wouldn't really go any lower than that because we can still clearly tell what the background is. The fireman himself is in good lighting. There's not a lot of bright lights on here, even though we have good light on half of his face, there are still a lot of dark points. However, even in the darkest points, being the gentleman in the background, that like part under the neck going down, here in the corners where we have the black of his coat. We don't have any grain or pixelation or anything like that. So ISO, I would say, is probably at the highest 800, but it's probably a little bit further down. It's probably closer to like a 500 or maybe a 400 for ISO because, again, we have some light coming in, but the lighting itself doesn't feel even. It's also not bright sunlight, so it's not something that's natural that's overpowering. And then as far as the shutter goes, again, if this is a staged photo and they're just standing there, again, shutter could be as low as 101, uh, 1 and 1 25ths of a second. However, if they're moving, if they're walking towards wherever they're going and they got this candid moment, they might be doing something closer to like a 1 and 5 hundredths of a second because we have some motion, we have some movement going, and if they're responding to a fire and trying to make it to their rig, then it's probably even a little bit quicker. So again, maybe around that 1 in 5 hundredths if there's moving. If this is a modeled image, 1 in 1 25th of a second, more than enough. we got this goat's head, ram's head. Uh, this one's always been a debate, and I, I can't find where I got this picture from. I just like the color of it and the mood. However, I get a lot of 
debate uh, whether or not this is a real goat or a stuffed goat. Like when you go to the field museum, they have like those settings where they show what the animal's habitat would be in. And the only reason I say that is because again, these animals like to charge and bump people and I can't believe it, how close they're getting. It's not doing anything. However, when we look at the goat, the goat is in perfect stillness. We've got the head and the body are perfect. Everything's in full focus. There's no blur. When we start to look at the background, we can tell that this is most likely a tree trunk in the back, in the right top corner, and that there's snow, dirt, branches everywhere. However, they're not 100% perfectly clear. So we've got really nice background to foreground separation where we can tell that there is a background of some sort, but we can't make out the finer details of it. This would lead me probably to believe that this is going to be something closer to maybe F8, maybe F12, around that range where, again, the background is something that we can make out. We can tell the shapes and everything else, but it's still blurry enough that our main focus, the goat, is clear. From there, ISO is pretty good on this one. Now, in this case, I don't see really any grain or pixelation in the darkest part, so under the chin or underneath the bottom left horn there where we get those really dark parts of the photo. I don't see grain, I don't see pixelation. So this would probably lead me to believe that the ISO is closer to that 800-600 range. Because of how dark the photo is in general, I think the ISO would be turned up a little bit so that it could take in as much light as physically possible. And then going into the whole, is it stuffed, is it real? That would be my main debate to have for the shutter speed. Since there's so much detail on here, I feel like it's a slower shutter speed. Something that's maybe closer to um, maybe 1 in 60th or 1 in 30th of a second because you can see every little individual groove on the ram's horn. You even get some blue marks on the bottom there. If this thing's moving, you're probably not going to be able to get something so slow to get all this detail on there. But if it's still, then you can be as slow as you want. So that's, that's the only point that I always get a little mixed up on. Some good motion here. So we talk about motion. We said freezing action. We definitely want one in a thousand or faster. And both of these are going to be in that category. When you think about how fast the frisbee goes, you got these prairie dogs running after them, jumping on all fours in the air. The photographer is able to capture these in perfect stillness. So these are definitely going to be high motion, very fast pictures. So one in a thousand for the speed or faster for sure for both of these. As far as the blur goes, we can. In the both photos, we can probably make out that those are cars behind the dog on the left-hand side, but that we're in some sort of park, forest, preserve, and there's the parking lot behind it. However, it's pretty blurred out. So if we really were to look at the chart, it's probably going to sit somewhere closer to that F4, maybe F6 range, um, maybe even F2.8. Again, depends. With the photo on the right side and the orange frisbee, we can make out that those are trees and bushes in the background. So those are probably going to be somewhere around maybe an F5.6, maybe an F6 at the most. Because um, we can still make out what that background is behind them. As far as ISO is concerned, there's a lot of light coming down and we can tell which direction the light is coming from because we can see where it's hitting our dog and then giving us this kind of small circle of shadow underneath both of them. So it's coming from the top right on both images. ISO is probably going to be somewhere around 100. Um, colors aren't that saturated on there even though they feel very deep and vibrant. So it could be one and two, or it could be two, uh, uh, ISO 200 as well too. Um, but probably closer to 100, just given how much light is present. So do you think those were taken like with just the, the shutter speed, like the S mode? It could have been. I mean, probably. Like, like what if you wanted to do that photo with like the background clear? Yeah, you could do that. Is that full manual? Like how would you do that? This would definitely be full manual. Most of the photos that you're seeing, the yeah. reason we're breaking them down is because they're most likely going to be full okay. manual. However, if you're trying to get something similar to this and you just want to be on one setting, yeah. shutter is going to be your best priority to right. be on. However, because of the camera compensating for whatever speed you turn it to, it's really not focused on what the aperture and that relationship between the two. So it's going to turn the aperture to whatever the most optimal aperture for that speed would be. So if you're shooting at one in a thousand, it's probably going to open up your aperture a lot so that way it brings in as much light as it can since you're being real fast with the shutter.
if that makes sense. And if you're full manual trying to do this shot, mm -hmm. and you, you have to like focus your lens, right? So focus your like lens. Pretty much like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, you, you have to basically what, what's happening on this one is that the photographer's probably using burst photography. Not a single shot, but the multiple. Right, so they're getting right. the ch -ch 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 -ch. Right. From there, then they've got their settings set up on there. So they know that there's a lot of light. So they only need 100 ISO. So they're not concerned about the lighting. Um, the background, they, they probably don't want it because, right. again, you probably can see that there's cars back there right. or just right. ugly foliage. So they're like, ah, no one really needs to see that. The main concern is these dogs catching the frisbees. So the background, they could probably get it down to 1.4, 2.8, depending on the lens that they had. The only thing they're concerned about is that speed at which the shutter is going. So if they want to even have a hope to catching them, they're probably doing these at one a thousandth or a little bit faster than that. Um, So, again, to get this type of effect with the background blur on there, it's full manual for sure. But if you're not concerned about that background blur, it's more of just capturing the action as it's happening, yeah. then definitely do shutter priority. Right. Let ISO be on automatic, and then your main focus is just changing that dial and then turning on bursts so that way you can just pull the trigger. And this is one of the last images that I have. And then we talk about lenses to finish everything up. You got a gentleman jumping, running into the end zone to score a touchdown. We can see that the sun is coming from the top view of them. Uh, it's probably setting a little bit, so we're getting this kind of overarching shadow. The front of him is dark. The back side of him is lighter. So ISO is probably also going to be 100 to 200 range. Again, there's a lot of light going on in the image. Now, this guy's moving very fast to be diving into the end zone, and we're capturing it so perfectly still that we can see the beads of turf popping up and running all over the picture. So if that's the case, our shutter speed is also going to be fast. Maybe one in twelve hundredths of a second, maybe one in two thousandths of a second, depending on how fast he was, how far down the field, etc. Um, from there, we're looking at the aperture. Now we can clearly see that there are two football players behind them. We can see the arm motions. It looks like a dude missed the tackle. But we can only see so much of them before it gets hazy and blurry. This is probably closer to an F, let's say, 12 or 16, where we can still make out the image very clearly and vividly. There's just slight background blur on there that's giving our main focus and center of attention to the gentleman in the Navy helmet who's running it. One more. Um, this one I really like because there's a couple different things going on in this one. This is a long exposure photo. And the reason I know it's a long exposure photo is when you look at the very bottom going this direction, you can see these red beams of light that cross right behind the mic. Those are going to come from a train or a set of cars driving past and a continuous open shutter capturing all of that as it goes, which would then explain why these lights that we have here are so extra bright because we have a setting. So there might be two things that happen. One, these lights could have just turned on as he was taking the image, which then gives these things, these big star and, um, which we'll call them, I can't, I can't think of the name, flares. Gives them these very intense flares that are coming around all the lights. We can see a little bit of grainy pixelation in certain areas where it's extremely dark. Um, so that would also lead me to believe that the ISO is turned up a little too high, which would also over-exaggerate the flares as they're going. As far as aperture is concerned though, they're still able to get a really clean image and you can still really make out all the detail on this front spoke and on the actual body of the physical uh, bike. So again, ISO is probably way too high, it's probably closer to 800 and it doesn't need to be that high, maybe even a thousand for ISO. Um, it's a long exposure picture because of the streaks going on, so that could be anywhere between let's say a couple seconds long all the way up to 15 or 20 seconds long. Uh, and then as far as the aperture goes, because we can see majority of it in perfect stillness, there's a slight blur on the background. I probably would put this at like an F18 or F16. Um, just a light, light blur in the background. It probably could even be an F22 where it's wide open. And maybe because of the light and how everything got affected on the picture, we're seeing a slight blurring in the background. So again, learning your camera is only the start. Anyone can learn to use a camera. Take this thing out with you, practice with it, play with it. It should become an extension of your body. If you go somewhere, bring your camera with you. It's a lot of fun just to take pictures of random stuff.
My personal favorite accessories to do with this is practice first and foremost. Um, when I was like 15, 16, I used to bring it with me to grocery stores because I thought that the product placement on shelves was really fascinating and the colors and the way grocery stores are laid up. I'm like, it's just a consumer. It's just really exciting for a consumer. So I would bring it with me there. Um, classes, you can go to places like Oakton Community College or the CCC, the Chicago Community Colleges, and they offer non-credited classes where you only pay like $200 and for five or six months they'll walk you through like any normal student would. You don't get a grade, you don't get any type of diploma, but you'll really learn from professionals on how to use your camera appropriately. YouTube is probably one of my favorite websites ever to be created. You can literally look up anything on YouTube and get an answer for it. Uh, I just retiled my bathroom not long ago. All learned how to do it on YouTube. Um, workshops are great too. I think I've mentioned before, I've got a couple different groups and clubs who come into app to buy stuff for their uh, workshops or for their clubs. One of my personal favorites are the O'Hare Shooters. They're these guys that have exclusive access to go onto the runway and stand in this one corralled spot and they can take pictures of planes as they go up and down. It's really cool the shots that they get. And then travel. If you leave the state, you leave the country, you leave for work or anything and you don't bring your camera, I think that's really foolish. Um, take it with you everywhere you go. Um, you're not going to get any better if you don't take pictures. Other recommended accessories, I think that for the most part, I always tell people that the top four are the most important things. If you don't have any of these, you should get them immediately. A bag, safe storage, easy way to carry things with you when you travel. You should always have an extra battery and a memory card. I talk about the importance of that last class. If they're vital. If you don't have two batteries, I think you should definitely get one right away. A lens cleaning kit, anything kicks up, hits the lens, dirties it up. You never want to use your t-shirt. It's Mary, uh, actually I think I have the saying in here, I'll save that for later, but the lens is super, is super important. And a strap, it's very easy to have it just in your hand, but it's also easy to put it down somewhere and completely forget, or become clumsy and knock it off when it's you know sitting on the table somewhere. So put a strap around it, keep it around your neck. Um, if it hurts after a period of time, that's where you have the camera bag. Throw it in the bag, put the bag on your shoulder, but you spend a lot of money on a camera, keep it in your sights at all times. Tripods are important if you feel like that's something you need for stabilization. We talked about storing your photos last week. External hard drives versus cloud-based solution. Choose one of those and run with it. I personally like the external hard drive because I like having tangible items. Excuse me. Um, filters. Polarizing filters are great. Those are going to help cut through bad, intense glares you get off things like snow or water or metal or any reflective surface. Neutral density does something similar, but it allows you to control the density at which your filter gets dark and light. So that's a really cool thing too. And then additional lenses, which we're going to go over at the end. Those are all important accessories or recommended, if you will. But again, the top four should be your priority at all times. My favorite saying, I... I forgot who told me this, but I've carried it with me for like 12, 15 years. Date your body, marry your glass. Your camera body is going to get slow. It's going to get outdated. You're going to bang it up. Um, it's going to become worthless. Eventually, though, your lens is what's going to be the most prized possession of your camera collection because those lenses really don't deteriorate as long as you're taking good care of them. Even if you're telescoping and they're moving in and out and they're being used, that's the whole point. They have nitrogen gas on the inside to help prevent those joints and that actual telescoping technology from getting ruined or played out too much. So date your body. Your body will get replaced eventually, but that glass from your camera, that's your big sweet spot. Um, last class I talk about the kind of the, the silliness of, of saving a dollar only to then have regret because you bought a product that isn't really what you're looking for. Same thing goes for glass. If you've got the money and you're looking at the glass, your glass should be a big part of your camera purchase. It should match your camera body in a sense. When we talk about glass though, it's important to make sure we understand what that means. Focal length and zoom are pretty similar and they acquaint to each other. What we notice is that the smaller the number on our lens, the more wide of an angle we're going to get. So for things like scenery or landscape photography, or maybe even star photography, astrophotography if you will, and other things, we, where we want something that's wide, something that captures a lot, because then we can get the detail out of there and get big landscape or, again, 
depending on what we're doing, big pictures. But when we want to get tighter and we want to see something, for example, we have these pelicans in the water, cleaning themselves, drinking, trying to find food, and we're so far away from them at 70 millimeters, but as we start to zoom in, we bring those pelicans into the foreground even closer to us. Now it's important to remember that as we zoom, not only will the pelicans get closer, but everything around it is going to get closer. And it'll almost feel very over-exaggerated how much closer it's getting. Because as we pull the foreground in, we're also almost doubling the perspective at which our background's at. And you can see as we start zooming in on these birds, how much bigger the background starts to get. So from 70, everything looks pretty normal. The birds are still pretty close, but they're, they're a distance away from the opposite shore and a distance away from us. Once we move into 105, they look like they're closer to the shore now, but they're getting closer to us. As well, too, the background also just almost tripled in size. Move to 200, same idea, background got even bigger, birds are even closer. And then at 400, we can't even see the sky anymore. We only see the mountains, the top of the building over in the background, and then our forest as well, too. So perspective will get wonky as we start to zoom in, depending on the subject matter and depending on the relationship between the background and foreground that we're creating. That's where using things like aperture to start to blur that out help a lot because if we get this wonky perspective, we can basically get rid of it and just focus in on our main subject matter, which in this case would be the pelicans. And this kind of shows it off again a little bit more, but this goes through all the numbers. So focal length and compression, and that's really what we're dealing with when we talk about that wonky background in the other picture. As we use smaller, tighter lenses, so in this example, I believe it stops at 16, that 16, 20, 24, 35, about when you get to 50, those are gonna be your tighter angles. 50 is what's considered the truest portrait. That's how our human eyes see things, is a 50 millimeter gaze. So anything smaller than that is gonna give us this hyper wide angle. And you can see the background when you get to those numbers, how far away everything looks, how wide of a landscape we're getting. But when we're taking pictures of people, we can see how compressed that that image gets. They almost get big bottle-nosed. They look like Gru from Despicable Me when they have a big nose. That's gonna happen as we go to a wider angle and then get perspective of, let's say, a human or something else. We get compression. As we, though, go into a bigger number, we can see at 135 how close that tree comes up, or at 200 is the num max number there. At 200, how close that background is to the back of our person's head, but then also how square or how round that head becomes. And this person's not even moving. They're staying in the same spot. All we're doing is changing the lens and our position with the lens from the subject matter. So beware of that. Depending on the lens that you're using, there will be compression either in the foreground or subject matter or even in the background as well too. Common lenses, and this is how we'll kind of end everything up on this one. So these are lenses that you're going to see when you're shopping around, and here's how you can understand them a little bit better. So your kit lens, that comes with your camera when you first buy them. The reason they're considered kit lenses is because for two reasons. One, they come in a kit, but then two, they're typically your entry-level, inexpensive starter lenses. And the way we can tell those out is by reading the numbers that are associated with so the way Nikon does it with theirs is they'll put the millimeter size on there. This is an 18 to 55 millimeter. Above that, though, it's going to put its maximum f-stop. Now, we talked about aperture in the beginning of class, but really the main thing with aperture is our foreground to background separation. It's our way of blurring out the background to have primary focus on our foreground. In this case, we have a 3.5 to 5.6, which when we were talking about it earlier, basically means that if you start at 18, you're gonna get a 3.5 as your maximum aperture. But as you start to zoom into that 55 millimeter, that 3.5 is gonna go away, and now the maximum number you can have is gonna be 5.6. Now you can go to 22, you can go lower if you are higher, if you will, but you're gonna sacrifice that background blur. So again, for these guys, they typically have a lower, or a higher maximum aperture that's not going to give you good focus or a good background blur. Really just gets you started. 
The next thing you're going to see are these single number lenses. We call that a nifty 50 or a prime lens. Prime being a prime number, meaning that it's a number that will not change. In this case, it's always going to be a 50. There's no zoom on this lens. The reason we call it a nifty 50 is for a long, long, long time, people thought that a 50 millimeter was the number one lens that you could have for your camera. It still is considered probably the best lens for your camera, but again, it all is dependent on what you're taking pictures of. But a 50 millimeter is great because usually you can hit a much lower maximum aperture. So in this case, on our other lens, we had a 3.5 to 5.6 being the lowest that we could hit. On this one, we have a continuous 1.4 the whole time, meaning we could blur the background out, get bokeh effect if we really wanted to, and keep the subject in a very prime kind of imaging or picture. Prime lenses always can achieve lower or higher maximum apertures than a telephoto lens can. Telephoto, the best you can get is 2.8. With a prime lens, 1.2, even 1 for some of the more expensive um, more expensive lenses. I've never seen a 1, but I've seen pictures of it, and it's pretty cool. But a 1.2, 1.4, very similar in what they're accomplishing. So it's like a telephoto lens, any lens I can like zoom? Mm -hmm. And that should be the next one that we talk about, zoom or telephotos. So think about a telescope or you know, anything that has that, yeah, telescope would be the easiest one to think of. Telescopes go in and out, you can get closer to objects, further from objects. Um, the whole point of that though is that they have that telescoping action. Telephoto lenses, basically the same thing. As you use one of these dials on here, and actually I should probably go back one slide, the only one that's on here is this ring. That's our lens focuser. If we're using the automatic or manual focus on there, manual focus is going to make us use this ring to find our focus. Autofocus lets the camera do that work for us. In the sense of telescoping lenses or telephoto zoom lenses, you'll have two rings on there. One is going to control the zoom that you have on the lens. The other is going to control the focusing. Some brands do it differently, but for the most part, your front one is going to be your focuser and your back one is going to be your telescoping zoom part. All lenses should have the same thing. Autofocus, manual focus, autofocus, manual focus. Uh, some lenses don't have it, but then the camera body itself allows you to decide that on there. But these are good examples of them. You got a 24 to 70, and you've got a 70 to 200. Both are very different numbers, but both are considered telephoto because they zoom in and out. Prime lens versus zoom lens, exactly what we just talked about. Prime is a single number, no zooming. You want to change the angle at which you're seeing your subject, you've got to move your whole body. If you're using a zoom lens or a telephoto lens, you can use the lens to its best ability to zoom in and out, or you've got to move yourself. Um, prime lens, you can hit numbers like 1.4, 1.2. With zoom lenses, 2.8 is going to be the best you're going to get, even with the most expensive lenses from any of these brands. And last but not least, the travel lens. Now travel lenses are typically these big numbers. So in this case, we have an 18 to 135 from Nikon. They are considered a lower tier level of lens because they don't allow, allow a lot of light in, nor do they have the best quality of glass or features. But where they really make a big difference are for the people who don't want to carry multiple lenses when they go places. So if you're going on vacation, you're on a safari somewhere, you don't probably want your 50 millimeter. You probably want something that has distance to it. You're probably going to want something that also can do wide angle and can still take a good portrait. So something like an 18 to 135 might be perfect for your vacation, your safari, um, if you really just want to bring your camera body and one lens with you. And then what lenses do you need? I put quotations around that because you truly only need whatever is appropriate for what you're taking pictures of. But if you were to sit there and say, I need, what lenses do I need? The most typical that you'll see is the 50 millimeter prime, your nifty 50. That's your main prime lens that you're using. Perfect for portraits, professional photography, things where you don't need zoom. You're just going to kind of sit yourself down and get that picture. When then you get into the zoom lenses, 24 to 70 would be perfect because you get a nice wide angle to that portrait. 
and then a 70 to 200 millimeter plus. So it could be that 70 to 200, could be 100 to 400, it could be just any big bad lens. And that's basically for your birders, for your nature, for the distant shots that you need where you really can't get close. You're just trying to get, um, yeah, where you really just can't get close. You're just trying to zoom in as close as possible. That's what then that's gonna be for. So they call that the trinity of lenses. So if you're looking to expand your collection, what exactly do I need? I always say start with either the 50 or the 24 to 70. 24 to 70 is my personal favorite lens because I think that it has some of the most versatile features on there without having to buy three different lenses. But if you're someone that is using this for professional uses or this is for a business and you're going to be taking different styles of photography or videos, then you might want to invest in having the trinity of lenses. And that's all I got for you guys. Next week is advanced cameras. That'll be the third Thursday of the month. We're going to go through things like photo editing. And we're also going to talk about videography and kind of doing content creation a little bit more in depth. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for you guys. Any questions for me? All good if there's nothing. You've got my information, so you can always call or email me if anything comes up. And then same thing for anybody online who pops on or who saw anything. Um, take a picture of this, email me, call me anytime. I'm off on Tuesday, Wednesdays, but I'm always available to answer questions. And I tell customers all the time too, if you can't make it to a class, but you really want help, just come into the store. And as long as I'm not busy with customers, and I can make sure that you're taken care of with whatever you got, so. So are the lenses she has good quality, like average? Let's take a look, let's see. So Tamron's wonderful. I love Tamron lenses. I think they do a really great job. You know, she does take some close-up stuff and far away. That's what she needs. She yeah. can't do other so, before like that. Well, fantastic. So this this hot this hot, so I was trying. You know, I, I the background obviously is cool. So this is cool. So I have that app. Yeah, yeah. Connected, so I download them to my phone. Yeah. So yeah, it does show. I was just trying to get like both birds in focus, yeah. and I'm like, so how would I? do that to get like because it would focus on this one and so that's what she's really hard to get photos it likes to focus on you're using one automatic for that mainly right this this was yeah this was like a couple weeks ago when i first got the camera so you want like, to switch to, to the p so if you want to continue using automatic but you want to set a couple okay. things yeah go to the p so I, I didn't try the p with the birds i didn't try with the dogs and that's what my my friend's dad who was a photographer he said definitely shoot the dogs in p so that's why yeah. this wasn't in p either the p or the a because that's going to okay. be your aperture priority. Right. On that. Okay, so P probably would get them both in focus. Well, you P is right? going to let you change on the camera itself. You can press the FN button, uh -huh. and from there you can change your focus area. Your focus area then allows you to go really tight, okay. zoned, go center, go flexible spot, okay. or go expand flexible spot. So that does that tell you on here what it was? No. With the, with the, it doesn't, okay. No, but if you're shooting on automatic, it's only using your like basic ones. It's using the center. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's oh, why okay. if you switch to P, you'll actually be able to then press the oh, FN okay. button and have access to all of those. So okay. you can customize oh, all that. Cool. If I'm on automatic and I press that, I don't have control over that stuff. I'm oh, basically okay. limited on what they allow me to play with. So yeah. for the for the P and for that photo, she's trying to get both birds. Birds would be the expanded. I would go expanded one on that one. Yeah, because in that way, there's it'll pick up on multiple spots that are in front of you. On top of that, too, I would probably use this lens. Yeah. Yeah. I would go to the aperture instead of the P, and I would bring this all the way down to 2.8, because then that way I can really blur the background out. This right. is a premium lens. Yeah. This is an awesome one because it's that 2.8 on there. Yeah. This is one of Tamron's best at the top. Okay. This one over here is still a great lens. It's just not going to be their top one, and so you're not going to get the best background blur out of there. It's only a 4.5 to 6.3. Yeah, and that one I basically just have bait for doing like. Like my daughter at her competition is So yeah. that doesn't really matter with the background. It's like, here, you're just trying to get the action. Yes. The um, more light that hits this lens, the better it will perform. So, yeah, this was before. This is like the dog. I think I showed this to you last yeah, yeah. week with the eyes in focus. Yeah. And then I, I, I got to practice some more. I just haven't had much time to do and it. And that could be probably good for the zone more, too, especially since it's got such a longer face when you're yeah. taking the picture. Yeah. 
and have, depending how close you're getting, if you do the zone, it probably will get you where it'll just do the middle frame on that. So that would literally be where they're at. Okay. So. Okay. And this would you would shoot the, this was this was probably an auto as well. Yeah. So doing P would get me. Do the P. You do the A. I would say P or A would be okay. great. You got a really long nose. Well, no, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still think it's cool, even though the nose is cool. I, I know the eyes are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely a sexy. Yeah. But no, I would say that's kind of where you're at. Yeah, and for, for the money, these are They're great. good. You know, yeah. I think for more money with the Sony brand lens, it wasn't giving the same. So, that, so it's tough because, again, it depends on where you're at. I think that Tamron and Sigma make excellent products. Um, especially, I think Tamron does a great job because they come in at a lower cost. The bodies mm -hmm. of the lenses are just not made out of the best materials. Right. Right. More plastic instead of the polycarbonate or metal. And that's the really nice part about using the Sony lenses, especially the G or the G Master ones. Yeah. You pay a pretty penny for those lenses, but they are truly the top of the line mm -hmm. glass. So, in the future, if you're ever looking to get something else, I think a prime lens would be great for you, like mm -hmm. a 50 millimeter, especially if you're really interested in getting the dog portraits and family portraits, stuff like that, because you're gonna get just a mainly portrait lens, no zoom, no nothing. Right. But then you can get down to like a 1.2, 1.4, but you get the premium glass. So a G Master for one of those might be a good option just to experiment with. What's G, G Master? The G Sony. The G Sony. G oh, so yeah, so 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 yeah. yeah. But just, that would be just the prime. The yeah, set. I would say do, try prime. Or you know, even two, come in on a day where you have time and throw a lens on. I, I know we bring people over by the fountain all the time. Yeah. And we kind of experiment a little bit and just right. get an idea for why, why a Sony versus a Sigma Tamron where you'll pay less. Then you'll really see the quality next to each other. Um, but as far as the lenses go, no, they're fantastic lenses. I mean, for what I do, I'm not a professional. No, 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 but that's, those are good lenses. And the nice part, again, that camera body will probably last you another nine years or so before it starts to kick the dirt. Yeah, he, he gave me that one down there because it was the last, the last one, one for 900. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could really beat that. Even, no. like, even like, I'm like, should I have gotten the nicer one? I'm like, no, I really can't. Start with that for now, and then again, I, I give it. it, it when also I become depends. a professional, then maybe I'll. Yeah. But it also depends too. Like you might hit a point where you're plateauing, where you're like, okay, all my photos look great. I'm not getting any better yeah. of an image. That's when then, okay, right. let me step up to the next right. camera body. But really, the reality of it is, you'll probably be more than happy with the photos you got. Right. But again, depending on how often. I was happy with my Nikon it. photos, and I think with this one, it's a step up. From oh, for sure. That one, and, and I don't even know how to use. Typically every five or six years you see the technology and cameras change where now there's something of substance where you're like, oh wow, that's that's sharp from what I have. Right. That's the first step. But then number two, you'll learn as you keep going, it'll get slower, it won't autofocus is quick enough. It basically the shutter count that's on the inside, which is the count of how many times those are opening and closing, it ticks like a uh, like your mile uh, like your mileage on your car. Yeah. And once you get to a certain point, it basically it's not bad, it's just it's slow. Right. And that's when you'll notice the performance issues. But again, you use it consistently on holidays, special events, I'd say good ten years. Thank you. Hey, of course guys. Anytime. Anything else for me? Everybody go grocery oh, shopping and fill up your yeah. car with gas so yeah, you don't have to go anywhere. It's tomorrow. gonna be bad. I <laughs> know. Uh, I'll be here, but it'll be bad. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Anytime guys, be safe. What you got? So I forgot my camera because of traffic. Yeah, no issues. Uh, I was wondering, like, I know I missed a bit of class. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, wondering where to find like your playlist and like your past recording. Yeah, here. Let me end this video since no one's watching. Thanks everybody for anybody who watched. I will be in the store um, tomorrow. I'll be in all weekend. I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday this week. So if anything comes up, call, email me. Whatever's easier for you. Have a great day, everybody, and as always.